Um, mm-hmm. The colloquial term is footsies, but we call it we call it footsies. <laughs> <laughs> Serious. <laughs> nice. Oh. What you're going to hear about today is nothing short of a miracle. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Pub Stomp, a podcast about games, TV shows, movies, and pop culture in general. Every episode, we discuss topics that we find interesting. Come join our shenanigans. Hey, welcome to another episode of Pub Stomp Podcast. Oh, guys, guys, today we have a guest, a guest appearance from John. Porta John. What's up, John? Hello. What's up, Maxi? Hey, hey. What's up, Tyler? Hey. Mexi sounds like crap because he's out in the <laughs> desert near the border eating tacos and shit. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So he, he made it happen. He's not, he's safe. He's in the good border on the good side of the border. Don't worry. I'm not in Canada. You're not in Canada. <laughs> he's not in Canada. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. How's it going, guys? <clears throat> good. Good. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. No, all right. I got should have capitalized. You should have capitalized and said he was <laughs> broadcasting live from the jungle or something. <laughs> the jungle. Oh man. Yeah. It's yeah. is actually now that now that I'm slight tangent, is the last time I went to my hometown, the border situation was kinda weird. There was a lot of like roadblocks and stuff. Have you been into that area? Is it still pretty yeah, it's still intense? It's still pretty yeah. intense. Yeah. yeah, dude, that that that's weird to me. Like it's yeah. So by it's that, not you what mean I grew up with. Heightened security. <laughs> heightened security. Yeah. There's okay. a like, crisis at the border, too. I don't know if you've heard this. <laughs> I mean, I've heard about it, but it was like you know, it's like it's my Florida hometown. Like shut I. The fuck up about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like where we're from is like pretty quiet, pretty quaint. There's nothing happening. It's not a big like just pretty chill. You know? But right. yeah, those road roadblocks are a little bit intimidating. Just barbed wires and stuff now too. Oh god! So is that is that all COVID stuff or is this? No. Did you just hear me? There's a crisis. Okay, 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 yeah, yeah, okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. (laughs) Oh man. Uh, But you know who's not in crisis? South Park. Uh, Oh yeah, man. (laughs) Oh yeah. They got that ching. Yep. Oh, they got the cha-ching. What are they? What well, well, you guys were telling me about it? I don't know anything about this. I know South Park and Paramount Plus, and that's all I know. Maxi, you want to tell me. us more about what, what was going on there? Yeah. So the South Park creators just signed a deal for fourteen movies on Paramount Plus. Fourteen movies about 14 South movies. Park. Fourteen sounds like a lot. Dude, One sounds like a lot. Thought was dying out. Yeah. Yeah, I, I heard it. It was. It's like. Two movies a year they're shooting for, and I guess based on how quickly they can animate the show, they should probably be able to animate the movies really quickly too. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Yeah, because the first I only watched that first movie. Is there only there's only one, right? The South Park movie. Yeah, and that was a, it was a little intense. Like I watched it when I was in high school, maybe. Yeah, right. Sounds it was, about right. It was funny for the time of my life. I don't think <laughs> yeah, I, I would think it was funny now, but I don't. know. I don't, yeah, it's 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 uh, it's intense. It's just not my kind of show. Just you know, uh, I, but I've 14. never liked any. any you never liked any South Park? Okay. Eh. Eh. Really, I would think that you would like it. Why? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't what are you know. trying to say? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, you make some jokes sometimes that it's like, oh, that's that should go on South Park, yeah. Uh, well that's cool man mm. or, like are we talking like fart jokes or or like looping social commentary <laughs> yeah. which are those two you yes. know it's best not to it's best not to ask the question oh you're putting them out there you're putting them out there oh snap yeah yeah so that's that's just why but i guess hey you know you have you have you're a man of class you know you don't like uh, certain stuff that's okay yeah to me for me it's too edgy i just can't do it also like yeah yeah animation's fine well, they try to be edgy. That's the thing. Yeah, I think that's it's the like thing. Right? Forced edginess. Yeah. Cool, John. John, do you do you follow South Park? Do you watch it? Yeah, I, I watched it uh, quite a bit in like up until like the season nine or something like that. And uh, it, you know, 
that the, the early seasons are definitely like, like the crude ones and the shock humor ones. And then the later, the, the middle seasons that I watched, they started getting into more, some of that social commentary stuff. And, mm-hmm. you know, there was that whole controversy about showing the prophet Muhammad and uh, Tom Cruise suing them and all that kind of crazy stuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's and there's like a anytime they would touch on politics, it would usually be like a, a middle, a middling stance. And that was always interesting to me um, that kind of created this whole subclass of uh, of uh, political beliefs called South Park Libertarians. If you ever get a chance <laughs> to Google that. <laughs> OK, we'll check it out. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah, you're right. It's more, most the most recent years has been about because I see the memes. Right. And it's, it's pretty funny, mm-hmm. but I just yeah. I don't know if I would watch the show. So that's good for Paramount Plus, right? Because I don't know what else they got going for them. I, I mean, I guess they have a bunch of movies. Paramount, yeah, Paramount's known for their their movies. I think they have like all the Transformers movies. Um, and actually, I toured their Paramount Studios once when I was in in Hollywood. Oh. That was super fun. Um, like we got to go see a uh, um a bunch of different sets for shows they were uh piloting. Um, like one was uh. It was for Paramount Plus. It was um, it was it was the Big Show, the wrestler, the Big Show, and the the <laughs> shtick was he the Big Show raises two daughters, and we got we got to watch walk the set and see the bedrooms of each daughter and and how big the big door is the the, the door is so that way the Big Show could get through it. <laughs> oh dang! <laughs> nice, nice, nice. That's cool. Well, yeah, I, I haven't. I don't know. Like now it seems like we're going back to cable time, but it's like on demand. It's like a different transformation, right? Yeah. Different era. Yeah. But cable's still around. So it's like, I guess it still makes you gotta, money. You got to share. So it's the only way that works. You got to share. Because it cut, right. cut the cord and then all of a sudden I have seven subscriptions. It's annoying. <laughs> I feel like they're yeah, all going to start uniting with each other and then you're going to get packages of streaming services. I think you've already got some of that with the Disney <laughs> stuff. Yes, you do. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so then that turns into your cable cable packages <laughs> I, I think personally what's gonna happen is disney's just gonna buy all of them and then it's fine <laughs> yeah. yeah and it's gonna yeah. be 50 bucks a month and then you get them as long as they don't bring back contracts it's fine as long as you can cancel whenever you want that's the big one right contracts because yeah cool cool all right well that's that watch watch south park is coming to your uh, tv near you on your streaming mm-hmm. devices on Paramount Plus, whatever that is. <laughs> uh, Fun fact before we break, Iron Man was a Paramount property. Huh? Oh, huh? oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, Disney was like, "What could have been? I need it what for what could have been. Yep, I need it for the thing I'm building. It's uh, this new concept called the uh, the Avengers. <laughs> the Avengers uh, Initiative. That'll yeah. never work." <laughs> that yeah. would, that's gonna stupid. make no money whatsoever <laughs> yeah so stupid uh, look at us now yeah next thing you know yeah. they're gonna have the fast and furious guys be super agents super secret agents <laughs> <laughs> all right so enough of that enough of that <laughs> shenanigans we're gonna get into what we're doing today, we're going to interview. We're going to ask John some questions. And I guess we didn't do a proper introduction. So John, or Porta John, also known in the gaming community, he does both competing and runs tournaments for uh, fighting games. And I don't know much about that genre. So we're going to ask John about some questions. And he's going to tell us all about it. But hey, John, if I missed anything in your intro, anything else you want to add, let us know. I think this is your, your time here. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, the big thing is, uh, I so I yeah I, I play games and I stream them and then I also run tournaments for them, um, and then I've been doing this for probably I've been playing games, competitive fighting games, uh, for about ten years. Um, I started in college, uh, with the release of Street Fighter Four, um, and then um, yeah, pretty much, uh, I've just been doing all that since you know the streaming kind of ebbs and flows based on what tournaments i'm running and um it's this most recent tournament we ran was a charity tournament super awesome nice nice <clears throat> so i guess we'll start with the with the first question you kind of said that you started 10 years ago mm-hmm. uh so i guess the general question is like what, what is the the fighting game genre and what is it that attracted you to it um yeah so i started in yeah in t- 2009 or so uh, the fighting game community timeline is interesting where, you know, it, the, the whole genre started with Street Fighter 2 um, in the in, it was released in the 90s. And, you, you know, everybody kind of 
that it was such a craze where it showed up in arcades everywhere. It showed up in gas stations everywhere, like, or they made all kinds of TV shows and toys and <laughs> movies and whatnot. So it became kind of a pop culture thing for a little while. Um, and then, you know, fighting games kind of rode on that success and like branched off and created subgenres from Street Fighter 2. And then around 2003, though, or like around 2000 and, or 1999, when Street Fighter 3 came out, um, it was not very well received initially. And so the fighting game competitive scene population kind of dwindled until uh, it hit its low in like 2003. Um, Ooh, the dark in 2003. Ages. Yeah, yeah, they call it the FGC Dark Ages. <laughs> oh, yeah, um, yeah. Um, and they called it like right before that they called it the Golden Age. Um, and then, um, so then you know, fighting it like there was a brief resurgence uh, with the uh, the Daigo Perry, and I'm not sure if anyone's here on the call has seen that, but it's um, it's basically a, a competitive player from Japan playing in a tournament in the U.S. and parrying an entire super where you have milliseconds to really like react to different mm-hmm. hits. Um, and that exploded, uh, that like exploded the scene a little bit further, um, and kept it alive for a little bit in two th- until 2009 when they revitalized the, the street fighter series with street fighter four, um, other fighting games within the scene at that time, like Tekken and soul caliber and whatnot had been and mortal Kombat had been releasing steadily, but even then there was never like the height of the competitive scene. Um, so 2009 street fighter four comes out and it brings in a bunch of new players and one of those is myself. And since then we've just grown exponentially. Um, so that's kind said, of a long winded <laughs> explanation. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, so, yeah. so I guess you were, were you always since you start, so you said, so somehow you had to get into the, the, the genre, right? Did you always yeah. just play the games? You loved playing fighting games. Yeah. I mean, uh, so, uh, you know, a lot of people, when they say they've been playing fighting games for a while, like they, they, they'll they say that they started really young and all mm-hmm. that fun stuff. Um, I didn't start until I was in college. And that was because of uh, um, uh, basically I had a friend in college who was played fighting games growing up and played with his brother all the time. Um, and he never played competitively or anything. He just played with his brother. And uh, we we were always hanging out every Tuesday at GameWorks in Arizona Mills, and GameWorks yeah. uh, does uh, used to do free play Tuesdays, um, and so you would always you you would basically pay fifteen bucks or ten bucks or something, and then you'd get unlimited games for the whole night. And you know, there's all kinds of different games to try and whatnot. But I started playing fighting games with my friend there, and he just beat my ass over and over and over again. And I was like, man, these are really intricate. These kinds of like all the different tools and options that you can do and the fact that like you're ultimately playing against one other person um, and there's really nothing and it's just you, your opponent in the game. And it's, there's no other like really complicated things besides that. Um, and uh, so I, you know, I just kind of got tired of losing to my friend and I bought copies of fighting games at home <laughs> and uh, just practiced until I beat my friend. And then when nice. Street Fighter 4 came out, that was like when I decided to try to beat other people's friends. <laughs> nice, nice. that's that's pretty cool spite is the ultimate motivator <laughs> yeah I, I think every every competitive fighting game player has a a storyline where they were playing with a sibling or they they wanted to beat their neighbor or they wanted to beat everybody at their local arcade and then it, it always just turns into okay now i want to beat the next like large group of people i want to beat everybody in my state and then i want to beat everybody <laughs> in my country and i want to be, beat everybody in the world nice so that's- is there any point where you're like, you see the matrix where you're not just button mashing, you actually know what you're pressing? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. There, there are instances of flow uh, to the mm-hmm. point where you are reacting without even thinking at times. Um, and it, like for an anti-air or for uh, a reaction super or something like that, like you're just kind of going for it and playing on muscle memory instead. That's pretty okay. cool. So it's like Goku Ultra Instinct <laughs> at that point. Yeah. If you're in somebody's head, if you're really in somebody's head, you know what they're going to do two steps in advance. And you can condition them to, to, uh, to actually get them to do what you want them to do. What? It's like chess. <laughs> yeah. It's like chess. Yeah. I watched some of your streams and I was like, you're trying to explain some stuff. I was like, I have no idea what's going on. You're like, <laughs> yeah. oh, yeah, clearly here. And, the, and you have the controller mapping, right? You have the buttons that you press. Mm-hmm. I was yes. like, I have no idea. Can't follow this. I, I, I honestly can't. But because it takes practice, right? 
<laughs> yeah, we have like our own like sub language, I guess, of of mm-hmm. terms, and that's probably why like it, it like my stream tends to focus on more of the competitive aspect of it, and you know I'll use different terms that we in the fighting game community use to describe a situation, but that's not always well translated. Like I might say, um, you know, I I got a knockdown. I'm going to go for Oki, and then that's a what that really means is, you know, I I knock the other character down. I'm going to put offensive pressure on my opponent as they wake up as they stand up and recover and and maintain my offense but it's way Oops. quicker to say i'm I'm going for okie yeah yeah okie stands yeah. for that too <laughs> <laughs> okie stands for okizeme and that's a that's a japanese term for uh, a wake up actually <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting yeah so, uh, so I guess going, you, you mentioned your stream briefly and I, that's, that's kind of like where I saw like what you did and kind of mm-hmm. like, kind of like I did a little bit of, a uh, investigation to kind of like to understand what, what the space was, but maybe you can explain a little bit more about the tournaments that you run and how they're structured. Cause that's, I, I used to watch a lot of league and I think Max used to watch a lot of league as well. Mm-hmm. We, that's kind of like some style of playing, but I don't know how it is in fighting games. And I watch <laughs> fighting game tournaments. I don't know oh, what's going on half the time. Yeah, oh, really? like Evo and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> nice. I'm just I'm just watching it like I see KO. So one somebody won. <laughs> that's actually <laughs> that's one of my favorite things about fighting games is they're pretty hype to watch. Um you you could know nothing about the game, but if you know that one person's life bar is way bigger than the other ones, or one person is about to die, <laughs> yeah. you get hype. It's yeah. really straightforward, you know? Yeah. Well yeah, like when you see a super go down, it's super cool because you're just like yeah. the screen flashes, it's like in a casino. You're just like, yeah. lights are happening, something cool. And yep. then when somebody counters, it's just like a really quick, like, the lights stop. You're just like, oh, what is happening? Yep. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, you know, there's layers to it because then that super could have been done in like preemptively based on the previous round's habits or something like that. And, you know, like really like astute players will see that and see the conditioning that happened over the course of the match. And that's hype. But then also just seeing all the, the crazy lights and stuff and the epic moment like that, that's also hype. So there's like these different layers that they, everybody unites in cheering at the same time. It's super cool. <laughs> um, so as far as tournaments go, uh, like uh, you can kind of break them up into different levels, um, particularly with uh, the way the pandemic has affected them. <laughs> Um, you have local tournaments and that's where, you know, every, every community based on their size, uh, both the size of the state and the size of the, uh, the people, the number of people interested in in fighting games competitively, uh, they, you you can run local tournaments. So in Arizona, uh, we actually have two, two or three local scenes, um, one in Phoenix, one in Tucson, and then one up North. Uh, there's a couple of folks I believe who play in, in Yuma as well. Um, Oh, Yuma. Yeah, and so there will be times where we run like local tournaments, and uh, that the numbers can range from ten to twenty to you know thirty for a new game release uh, when everything everybody's hyped. Um, and then every now and then we'll all kind of have a big tournament where all the different scenes come up and play each other. And usually we have that in Phoenix, and so you have you know forty or fifty, sometimes seventy players. Um, and then you get you get a little bit larger. You go to the major level um, where you get, you know, hundreds or thousands in some case, or not closer to hundreds of entrants. Mm-hmm. Um, and those are like your your regional majors, like your combo breaker or your CEO or um, uh, SoCal regionals. Um, those are, you know, those are the ones you travel to other states for. And then you have like the mega tier uh, uh, tournaments like uh, Evo, which is the largest open tournament uh, in all of esports, I believe, where um street fighter 5 currently holds the record for most entrance at, at 5000 um oh, and that's that those function as essentially the world championships because everybody who everybody flies in for evo um so yeah, as far nice. as tournaments go i've competed at pretty much every level uh, and then i've run tournaments uh my my the tournaments i run tend to be run locally um Oh, like I, I, I don't have a lot of partnerships with the the big guys. Uh, that's not really something I. I it's, it requires a lot of traveling. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. So is it, are most tournaments like are most of the tournaments like a bracket system or mm-hmm. or something like that or like best of five? Yeah, yeah. So um, the all tournaments are run on a, in a double double elimination format. Um, the reality with uh, fighting games is um, or any any 
asymmetrical game is that you're going to have bad matchups, even in chess, right? You have like black as a bad matchup for white, uh, or rather the other way around, <laughs> white beats black <laughs> because it goes first, right? Yeah, um, yeah. But um, uh, so the way to mitigate bad matchups is to give everybody a second chance. So double elimination bracket, if your, your viewers aren't aware, is when you play a tournament match, you advance to the bracket. But if you lose, you go into a, a loser's bracket or a lower bracket where mm-hmm. um, you basically get to play there until you hit the end of your bracket. And then the winner of the winner's bracket plays against the winner of the loser's bracket. Nice. So everybody gets nice. two shots, basically. Nice. That's pretty um, cool. Are they pretty fast? I imagine, right? Because the games don't go for that long. They're pretty fast. Uh, it's going to depend on the game. Um, it's, gonna, it's also going to depend on the life cycle of the game, where... Early on, people don't have their damage and combos optimized, so they're going to do less damage, and the games are going to go longer. Um, and then later on in the game, um, you know, it's it, everyone's super optimal. They're doing like max damage punishes and combos, um, and that will uh, usually that's where what like Marvel versus Capcom three is a really good example where um, you know at the beginning the game had a lot of time overs because nobody could um, nobody could do full combos. They would do maybe like twenty five percent life on one combo. Um, but then at the end, everyone's killing a character in one combo in a 3v3 gotcha. game. So it, everyone loses in three hits. Oh, so God that damn. that leads me to a question. But do the tournaments start as the game releases? Or yeah. does the game usually have some time? Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, everyone's that's, hyped that's about cooler, the game. actually. Yeah, yeah so there's, there's the, the, the phase of the game is like the discovery phase where nobody yeah. really knows like what the best thing is, who's top tier, what the meta looks like. And then that that's where every, like creativity shines the most. You got you're, it's a, you're racing basically to be the first person to figure out these who's the best right. and what kind of um, you know offensive pressure defensive tools are are effective in the in the new game engine. So adding to that, is there so like you mentioned earlier, like Street Fighter was the one that started it off, and then like Mortal Kombat and came. Is there like yeah. tribes like oh absolutely certain people only play Street <laughs> Fighter, certain people only play or like. I know like Guilty Gear is kind of the same as other ones, like yeah. uh, Blaze Blue or something like that, right? Uh-huh. So, yeah, yeah. You, like? So you can usually you can break them down into like Capcom players. Um, they tend to play only Street Fighter, but they can branch out into the Marvel versus series. Um, then you have 3D players. Um, that's a whole different subset where you can have Tekken players and Soul Calibur players. Um, uh and doa players um <laughs> sounded like you had disgusted by that <laughs> no i forgot about doa as a 3d game my, my friend's gonna kill me <laughs> he's, he's, there's a big doa uh proponent scene here um uh and then um nrs players um those are the folks that play mortal Kombat and injustice anybody that plays a game by nether realm studios they have a pretty much a pretty um uh unique engine and so those play- kinds of players tend to focus solely on NRS games. You get Smash Brothers, uh, where that is uh, a very uh, different kind of fighting game. They call it the platform- platformer fighter subgenre. Um, and then, by and large, they're probably the most insulated uh, scene where I don't see a ton of crossover. Every now and then, you'll see one one or two players give it a shot. I think like Leffen's trying right now. And then locally, we've got a ton of Smash players that are into Guilty Gear. Um, and then you have anime. And anime is that big umbrella that you mentioned, which is like Guilty Gear, Blaze Blue, Blaze Blue Cross Tag, Persona, Melty Blood, um, what's some Grand Blue Fantasy Versus, uh, basically anything by Arc Systems Works or uh, uh, indie Japanese developer. <laughs> <laughs> um, those they're usually like heavily anime inspired games, and those are the ones with crazy offensive mechanics and movement. Uh, so I guess following up, so you say you you run tournaments, is it? Do you like also MC the tournaments as people are fighting? Because I, th- I think Me- Mexi and I went to E3, and I, I don't know if you remember Mexi. We, we sat down on some chairs and we're watching tournaments sponsored by T-Mobile, and somebody is describing what's going on. Do, do, are you that kind of person describing what's going on during the tournament, or are you doing like, the logistics behind it? Um, it kind of depends on my my capacity as far as the tournament goes. I like uh-huh. I help run a lot of the tournaments that my friends are like the head honcho of, like showrunner almost. Um okay. and in those cases I help out and do commentary. Um oh, cool. Other times, um, you know, I'm the, the 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 tournament was my idea and I'm running the tournament. Um and so mm. I'm busy and so I, I use other commentators instead. And we kind of just rotate. 
nice and so you guess you do to do it all i guess yeah yeah and the commentary stuff kind of helped me a lot with streaming um where it's actually an interesting challenge because playing and 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 talking at the same time is kind of hard especially if you're like really focused um mm. but the commentary has helped me kind of take take a step back and look at my gameplay as a viewer not just as a player and that's a lot of fun it helps actually helps yeah, me get better too yeah nice nice that's pretty cool so when you do these tournaments do you focus like do you do you, i know you do mostly street fighter but like do you only do street fighter or do you try to include the other genres or not genres but subgenres i guess is the best word yeah yeah um so with um i mentioned locals earlier right um mm -hmm. we can run tournaments and we can actually run tournament series um there's a a specific format that we use called ranking battles and that's been around since before i was part of the scene where uh you run five tournaments in a on a bi-weekly fashion uh and that encompasses a season where the first the, the person get, that gets first place at each tournament kind of accrues points and uh, top eight i believe accrue points and at the end you have a, a final winner for the season um oh, and so in, yeah yeah and so in those ranking battles we call them ran bats um they are uh, usually a ser series of different games, and for each scene, basically. Um, right now, our our like current games are Street Fighter V, Guilty Gear, Strive, Tekken Seven, um, and then there's usually some smaller uh, events like Dead or Alive or uh, Samurai Showdown. I, I think that game might have died out uh, a little <laughs> bit, though. Um, but yeah, we try to include multiple games, multiple genres. Nice. Cool. cool. Uh, so I'm going to ask, like, the, your stream is called uh, Spiral Series. Is that mm -hmm. like, uh, is it tied to a specific tournament or like specific uh, entity? Or yeah. you, maybe just tell me. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, it's, a, it uh, it's a reference to Tengen, Tapa, and Lagan. <laughs> oh. I don't know. It's an oh. anime. You guys have seen Dude, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. love that. We love Guren yeah. Lagan. So. <laughs> Dude, I was that... wondering too. I was like, ah, is it? Is it? No, it can't be. Yeah. Okay, nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's related to spirals. I also went by yeah, a former it's... gamer tag that uh, was referencing spirals. Um, and so I was just like, yeah, there's, I, I like Grand Lagon a lot and spirals are cool. Dude. So we're doing it. <laughs> oh, nice. Yes. You Grand became Lagan so much of, cooler. Yeah. It's one of, it's one of my favorites. And uh, it warms my heart that you said that. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anything by Studio Trigger is awesome. Kill Out Kill is <laughs> yeah. also amazing. Uh, the, is there anything? You've seen Pro Mare. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, suck it. Suck it. <laughs> nice, oh, nice. My heart just fluttered a little. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we're, I, we're I, fanboys. I, I originally picked Spiral Series uh, because I wanted to do a tournament series, and that's what I wanted to call it. Uh, and that ended up being a brand uh, for uh, the tournaments that that I ran. I started that with my with my friend Terrence. Um, and then you know, with those tournaments, it gradually. Uh, technology evolved where we could stream those tournaments live and this is in 2013 or so and uh, so I started we started streaming on a on a channel and then uh, we were doing stuff like sponsoring players and using it as a clan tag so you'd see SSE uh, in mm -hmm. front of people's names um, and then you know over time I kind of I kind of stepped away from being the main organizer in Arizona to just being more of a player um, and then I started streaming more regularly, particularly during the pandemic where I didn't have a ton to do. So I was streaming a lot and I just yes. continued using that brand ever since I had all the assets from, you know, the, all the promotional material for the tournaments. So I'm just like, I'm going to reuse yeah. this. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's the hardest thing. I think I mean, we started this podcast because of the pandemic too. So uh, I get you know you. how it is. Yeah. 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 Cool. Cool. All right. So I guess you already described which kind of uh, games you're playing and, uh, so I'm going to skip that question and we're going to go to the, the more like meta questions. I know you, you mentioned that games, fighting games usually follow some meta at the beginning. And I'm, I come from League of Legends. So usually like some kind of meta when you mm -hmm. play those subs of game that develops. What are some of the current, uh, maybe it's, I don't, hopefully it's not too technical of a question, but what are some of the metas that like exist in these types of games? Sure. <clears throat> yeah. Um, in every fighting game, there's always going to be a neutral game. And then there's going to be a wake up game. And so a neutral game is basically your opponents are kind of sitting at a state where they are, they don't have advantage, they don't have disadvantage, they're just in a neutral spot, and then you are as well. And at some point, someone makes a move to be the aggressor. Um, and so you can best compare that to, in League of Legends, you can best compare that to the laning phase, 
where mm-hmm. you're kind of weaving in like if you, top lane is probably the best way to describe a fighting game where you are weaving in and out of people's ranges um mm-hmm. you are trying to check your opponent get them to overextend and then capitalize on it right um yeah. when you when you kill your opponent in um in league of legends you know you force them back in the lane and then you get to take advantage of that right it's like that in fighting games where you eventually you get a knockdown or you get some kind of offensive pressure on them and at that point you transition into a um a, a mix up game where it's it's almost like a weapon triangle where you have strike throw and block so strike mm-hmm. beats throw and throw beats block and then block beats strike and so every every fighting game you can kind of boil it down into that and then they branch off of that as well where your strike can be an invincible strike or a non-invincible strike or it can be a slow strike or a fast strike or your your throw can be invulnerable to a uh, certain to another throw or like your blocking can be you have to block high or you have to block low or all all kinds of different things there or for 3d games you can sidestep this um the, based on the kind of different based on each subgenre, that's where it evolves but then you can always boil it down to strike throw and block um okay yeah that's interesting yeah um, thank you for the analogy to lee because i that helps a lot <laughs> that sure, yeah. A lot. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah this is english now yeah, I know, right? I was like, oh, because I, I, I swear, man, I tried to watch these these things, and I was like, I have no idea what's happening. Like, but that's, that actually makes a lot of sense. You also have so, character matchups, like archetypes, where, um, mm-hmm. you know, certain, like a zoner will will tend to beat a grappler because they can keep them out, or a mid a mid ridge rushdown character may lose to a zoner because they got to get in. Like, um, like character kits, uh, is a good way to kind of you can describe different matchups that way, and it's going to vary depending mm-hmm. on the game on how hard or or easy they can be so i guess to that point when you somebody's when you're in a tournament or or you're playing against somebody Mm -hmm. do you get to pick is there like a pick order like you pick something and then i'll pick after to kind of like or is it you pick at the same time blind pick i guess um you can do both uh the big thing about fighting game tournaments and uh is that a lot of characters a lot of people can only play like one or two characters they have a, a a main and then they have a counter pick character uh, to mm-hmm. cover bad matchups um and uh you know there are some players that can play like four or five characters but that's very rare uh usually you see one person playing one character for the entirety of a of a game and then they'll, they might actually switch between seasons based on balance patches but they'll still only mm-hmm. play that one character because that's see. all you can really like um handle i guess yeah yeah that makes sense you mentioned the weaknesses so it would be kind of it would suck if you always had like a bad matchup yeah and you could do nothing about it so yeah, so what'll happen then is um uh people kind of you can request a blind pick um and so you can avoid matchups or you can uh, you can avoid counter picks that way but otherwise it's kind of like whoever wants to uh pick first. That's actually in a lot of ways that's the first part of the tournament match. The tournament match actually starts on the character select screen because you can tell if a person is waiting to counter pick you then they may or may not you can tell them they have two different characters at least and they may or may not know how to play both of those characters to the full capacity that you know how to play your single character. And gotcha. so you play this dance, or maybe you have like two or three characters that you want to counter pick with, and you play this weird dance until someone either calls for <laughs> blind pick or um, you, uh, you eventually settle. Someone settles on playing a bad matchup. Gotcha. Uh-huh. This is like the, the meta game of the game. Damn, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Mind games. Yeah. Yeah, you know, for the timer to go to zero, it's like, who's going to pick first? It's a game of chicken, right? Yeah, I, there's, nice. a, there's a joke we use or a saying we use, they say, called, uh, where you lose at the character select screen, where you're playing such a bad matchup that you've already lost before the game started. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Damn. Man, that's interesting. <clears throat> uh, so you mentioned, like, balance patches. So, like, what yeah. do they do to keep the meta from getting stale, right? Because in most, like, from my understanding, there's not much you can change, right? in the fighting game so like how do they keep it fresh how do they keep people excited to keep playing yeah i mean um do you want me to use more moba analogies or <laughs> you can do explain know, however whatever, you want. yeah yeah however you want man okay cool cool so um you know balance patches are a relatively new thing in the fgc um where uh before what you would do to rebalance is release a new version of the game so street fighter 2 came out in 91 uh street fighter 2 uh, Super Street Fighter 2 came out after that, and then it's followed by Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo, Super Street Fighter Hyper Fighting, et cetera. Like they just keep release, releasing the same game over and over again, but it's got slight tweaks where, oh, we added a combo counter, we added cancels, we had added um, 
uh, new characters or we change some some frame data. So all those kinds of things are like the knobs and dials that you can you can twist in order to try to achieve as a best of a balance as you can, where you have everybody that's fun to play, but they're also really good. And you can have you're gonna have polarizing matchups no matter what, um, because it's an asymmetrical game and there's just always a ton of characters in each fighting game. But it's about trying to tune it tune an individual character's um tool set uh and balance an ecosystem of matchups between all the different characters in the game. And there'll be times where you can tweak it at the universal level and say, okay, I want to introduce this new universal mechanic so everybody has access to it. And then some characters are going to benefit better from that than others. Um, uh, I see that a lot in, in Guilty Gear or anime games in particular, where you have uh, universal mechanics that everybody has. So everybody has a strong defensive mechanic or everybody has a strong offensive mechanic. And you can use those to kind of le- like even the playing field while still keeping the, the, um, diversity between all the casts and their options uh, in mind. Okay. Nice, nice. So I know you probably played a lot of like different fighting games and stuff. Like there is, is there ever a point where you're like, you get a character and then you're like, this character is the same as this other one. Like, does it ever get to that point to you? All the time. Yeah. All the time. <laughs> no, that's, that's important too. Cause everybody's got their own unique style. Um, and so like I may fa- even me throughout my career I've I've phased between different styles like currently I like playing very slow defensive style um and so like I play Chun-Li in Street Fighter 5 and so the first thing when Guilty Gear came out the first thing I tried to do was find a character that was like Chun-Li um and mm. I settled on uh a character called Ramlethal where she focuses on long distance pokes and then pressure after you knock them down from your long distance pokes like you or poke is a fighting game term for just like sticking out a, a big button, like hitting medium punch <laughs> or hitting slash, and then you know that mm. takes up space on the screen. Oh, I want to add to that the balance and, and, and that sort of thing. This might be a stupid question, but over based on your experience, and I know it's going to depend on the game, but does it seem very balanced where uh, many players are playing different characters, or do is there a strong meta where people focus on? a few um it's going to depend on the game i know for mortal Kombat, like nrs games uh, in particular a lot of characters play similar to one another and so it's easier for players to play multiple characters um there are other times when balance is just so absurdly lopsided where you have an s tier and that's three or four characters um that are uh dominant and then your whole meta revolves around uh counter picking those characters um examples mm. of the, so most that that's kind of a from a previous era where balance patches weren't common enough. So like Marvel versus Capcom two is a really good example where you have a top five like Sentinel, Magneto, Storm, Cable, uh, uh, and uh, those characters are just rotated amongst different teams, and everybody else in the cast just gets completely washed by them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but that's because they stopped releasing new versions of Marvel versus Capcom two because they didn't have the Marvel license, and like so. <laughs> those kinds of lopsided games uh sometimes become more fun that way um where the, you only have to learn a couple matchups um but they don't happen as often mm. anymore that's a fair point i haven't looked at it from through that lens yeah another example is third strike where or street fighter 3 where you have chun yun and ken as the top and then uh you have a whole like second tier of characters that are based on counter picking them as the meta and then you have the characters that are complete garbage <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Cool. So the next question is, uh, I guess if, if Maxi were to, you know, say I'm going to become a fighting game genre, you know, person, he's like, which game would you recommend starting with like right now in 2021 and, and why? Ooh. Ooh, I want to add to this too. <laughs> to this. Is there like a tier list of fighting games? Like you say, it, and maybe this is all opinion or maybe there's like a general consensus, like, we say Street Fighter Five is the best fighting game. Oh et cetera, no! Et cetera. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting baited right now. Yeah, no, um, you don't have to answer. You don't have to answer. It just there, there, like whose game is best is always going to be a, a hot, hotly debated topic. Um, there's going to be uh, it's it's tribalism at its finest. Um, <laughs> there are there are entry level games, I think, uh, and the beauty of those games is that you can 
keep playing those games if you want, or you can branch out into more complicated games based on your preferences. Um, those entry level games, I would put Street Fighter as one of them for sure. Um, Tekken would be another one, and then Smash Brothers would actually be the third one. Where, um, based on like, I would I would say, do you want to play two D? You want to play three D, or do you want to play platform? And then from there, decide um, what you like best about each of those games, and then branch into your subgenres. So, like for example, with Tekken, right? Say you really like you like Tekken a lot, but you don't care for as much for movement, or you wish that you could be juggled less than you would play. You could try DOA instead, or you could try Soul Calibur instead if you want a more of a high low guard break system. Um, for Street Fighter, you can decide, hey, I really like offensive pressure and movement, um, so I want to transition to anime games, or I can if I like defense, then I could. Uh, I could stick. I could move more to like an NRS style game. Um, that kind of all, all they all kind of like branch into one another, basically. Um, and frankly, like it's going to be your, uh, like it's going to be your complexity, but it's also going to be your aesthetics. It's going to be what art style looks the best that you would be most passionate about, because you're more likely to stick with the game if it if you like it and it looks cool. Um, so like I know a lot of folks that like the the NR, the Mortal Kombat style where it's pretty realistic and it's um, but it's also like 80s camp, you know, and then you have yeah. kind of the anime games if you're a big fan of anime and, and Dragon Ball fighters came out recently. And, you know, if you love Dragon Ball, then you're going to play it, you know, or Marvel versus Capcom. You know, if you like if you like Marvel properties, because those are I hear those are pretty popular right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah or doa for no particular reason right? yeah yeah doa if you like <laughs> if you like costumes <laughs> yeah or volleyball D- i heard they have a really good volleyball game <laughs> oh yeah yeah <laughs> no but doa in particular also has a uh has a rock paper scissors um uh combo break, uh, combo breaker system uh and that's uh, that's unique to it's it's it, that that game's engine and i know a lot of folks that like that over tekken for that reason see so i guess a, a, a small aside here doa stands for dead or alive dead or alive and the and it's famous because of its uh explicit yepness right yeah yep. I, okay yep. <laughs> just just to make sure I'm, I'm sure it's make sure it's one make sure it's the game that I'm thinking. yeah yeah a lot of fan service see i I just can't do that i, I will stop watching an anime if there's too much of that <laughs> yeah. I, I just I just can't it's like i can't i can't get out of my face you don't like you don't like the beach episode every every anime (laughs) (laughs) it's just like you know it's not for me (laughs) cool cool all right so i guess transitioning to that like so now you you picked a game you maxi got his own game and now he's like getting good at the game so there's usually some techniques that you have to master like i guess if you're sticking with the um uh, mobile analogy farming is a big thing you need to learn how to do so you can like farming is is essential to the game because more farm you do the more money you get the more things you can buy so is there something similar in fighting games and what's something that kind of like an intermediate strategy that you as you practice the game what is that thing that you're looking for does that question make sense yeah yeah um yeah uh there's a couple different routes you could go to kind of get uh best practices so to speak um everyone talks about fighting game fundamentals um and Mm -hmm. that is uh some form of space control so i mentioned top laning as a good example where you're weaving in and out of people's ranges and you're in a neutral game um Mm -hmm. the colloquial term is footsies but we call it we call it footsies where you're kind of like wiggling (laughs) in and out and you're sticking your (laughs) kick like you're literally sticking your feet out there to try to like play footsies with them (laughs) um so we say that a lot play footsies with them return to neutral um and so a lot of that is just knowing your uh knowing your ranges, your character's ranges, your character's options. Uh, so I, if I hit crouching medium kick, I know that I control you know, X amount of space on the screen. So I can threaten with that and keep my opponent from moving into that space. Um, so understanding what your normals reach and then from there figuring out, okay, I landed this normal attack, this crouching medium kick. Uh, what, what can I get off of that? Can I combo that into a knockdown? And if so, then I get into that, that strike throw block triangle I mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, always maintaining situational awareness, like knowing how much meter, how much life your opponent has, because uh, that can influence their decisions psychologically. If they if they have if they have if they have a life deficit, then they're going to be more aggressive in order to to um, make up for that deficit. Same deal as like with League of Legends. If someone's ahead on kills, right, they're going to be more aggressive because they have the tools to do so. Mm-hmm. Uh, the currency that uh, we have in fighting games is meter. 
Uh, so every every attack, every uh, that lands or even is blocked, you can build meter. Every time you take a hit, you build meter, and then you can use that to increase the number of options that you approach your opponent with, like with supers, with ex moves, with uh, Roman cancels, depending on the game. Um, and then your time, uh, knowing like how long the game the game is gone, because at the end of the game timer, whoever has the most life wins. Um, so. Mm. Uh, if you have 30 seconds on the timer, you may actually be more inclined to be defensive because your life lead is so large. Or if you, you know, there's only 10 seconds left and you, and you're, you have a life deficit, you got to go balls to the wall. Mm. Um, and then from there you can use that to see what your opponent's going to do. Um, and then, you know, once you're like really like good fundamentally and you know, like how to play the game and how to condition people and play that mental game with your opponent, you can start getting into the deeper concepts like frame data and knowing like, you know, this this button, you know, I blocked this, it's plus three on block, and my fastest move is a four frame normal, so anything that Push. I hit is going to be hit, uh, is going to be counter hit, and so I shouldn't hit a button there, but maybe my opponent knows that, so I'm going to invincible dragon punch and blow through everything, like, you get into that, like, frame data math, mathematical equation check, and you, yeah, it's pretty fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I imagine that, like, a gif with the guy, like, doing math in his head. Yeah. Card counting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh dang that's intense yeah i never thought, i never thought that was i know right <laughs> frame counting i've only heard i've only heard of that in speed in speed runs like frame yeah and stuff. Yeah. yeah it's something very similar yeah nice thanks, thanks for that because that's that's pretty that's pretty in depth yeah so if, guess, you, uh, if you want an explanation for frame of uh, frame data i can go a little bit deeper but i don't know how interesting that would be <laughs> <laughs> i think we could probably save that for another one so for sure. I think this, this is as far as we can go in there <laughs> yeah. uh but i guess i guess on to that note i guess since you mentioned that are do you recommend any like first like gear like I, I, most people use fight sticks right uh gear or like stuff like that yeah um i mean so the fighting game community like the community part is a big aspect of it right and so some a lot of folks like they pick up an arcade stick and myself included i picked up an arcade stick to to fit in uh to at the, in the community because everybody was mm -hmm. using a stick at that time because everybody came from right. arcades um and you know you get this idea that it's tribalism at its best so you get this idea that the arcade stick gives you the advantage but nowadays you know with more modern games people are designing them with multiple kinds of controllers in mind um so you don't actually need a fighting game uh, a fighting a fight stick if you don't want to play on one if you grew up playing on a controller then play on a controller there's one guy uh it was an evo match he beat a guy he beat a well-known player in blaze blue with a steering wheel um, what? The what steering wheel controller the reality <laughs> is the steering wheel controller is just a pad a controller that that has a big wheel on the outside of it and then oh, your your triggers are, are like paddle shifters and those that's the only difference but it was okay. hella hella on brand for that guy his name is wheels <laughs> if i recall correctly wheels. <laughs> um but yeah if you, if you really want to pick up gear um you know there's uh the best fight sticks that i can think of um like the cadillac of the of the of the fight sticks is the Vitri victrix pro it's like a 400 hundred dollar stick um mm. quanbo obsidian i would also recommend as a good entry uh that's like probably closer to 150 200 dollars um and then razor makes some pretty good products too razor like oh. the well go ahead i was gonna ask uh does wireless versus wired have like a tribalism kind of thing too yeah <laughs> for a, a lot of different reasons um wired is always going to be um faster uh rather it's going to be have less latency uh so i mentioned like frames right you're counting frames and you're hitting like one frame timings that's one sixtieth of a second so if there's latency on your controller you're going to be kind of screwed but for controller players like um like ps4 controller players like they don't have any other options besides playing wireless because the ps4 doesn't allow you to add, like you can plug it in but it's still connected via wire bluetooth um and uh from a tournament standpoint, it's a nightmare because uh, when it's wireless, that means anybody can like sign into the game uh, remotely. So oh. if you have a big major tournament and you have like hundreds of people walking around and some guy just played on his tournament set, unplugs his controller and leaves the controller synced with the PS4, uh, he walks away and then his, you know, his, he puts the controller in his pocket and his finger brushes on, on the home button. And then that activates the old system. Oh, no. And if someone's in the middle of a tournament oh, match no. there, it pauses their game. And at that point, it's nobody's fault in the tournament match. So you can't, you can't, you have to basically restart the whole thing. 
So they're a nightmare oh. wireless controllers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, dang. Never thought about that. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, so what makes a good controller or a good fight stick, right? Because I know like people look for specific things, but what makes what makes a good piece of gear? Um, it's kind of like when you ask, like when, when you, you go on the internet and you say, I want to learn how to play a musical instrument and you don't like, or a guitar, right. And you don't want to skimp on, you don't want to get a crappy one because it's not going to, it's just going to give you more trouble to learn on. And so you, there's like a certain standard for fight, fight sticks where, um, you want to have Sanwa buttons or some equivalent of Sanwa JLF buttons. Um, those are a Japanese com- company that makes these push buttons that are, um, they are activated via ball bearings. And so they're not like cherry switches, like in a keyboard because mm-hmm. cherry switches actually have a, uh, a degree of give and delay on them. Um, well, we all know cherry's trash on this podcast. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. People have been trying. So we under- <laughs> oh, go- sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, so we understand. Yes. We understand <laughs> this. Um, arcade, like the actual like joystick part of the, the fight stick um, is a, uh, is, it can be a variety of different parts, but I would recommend a Sanwa JLF first. Um, those are um, kind of the standard. They have a square gate and the throw is pretty, pretty short. Uh, they come standard in every stick that I just named too, like the Obsidian and the Vitrix and the, the, uh, the, H- the Razor products. Um, the one thing that I would not recommend getting is one of those 4E starter product products, like the $60 or the $100 even arcade sticks because those are made with like knockoff parts um and they they don't last as long they're not as quick quick as responsive you have to hit them harder so it's actually harder on your fingers like um if you're gonna if you're gonna invest in one i would go for uh like standard parts like sanwa that makes sense yeah the the thing that i remember from playing fighting games on a controller is that you get like blisters on your fingers yeah where you, it sounds like you wouldn't get them with like the fight stick uh you can get you can get blisters if you hold the stick a certain way or gotcha. if you, you and you, like the uh i guess injuries in the fgc are actually a relatively new phenomenon because um <laughs> we are at the point now where people are doing it professionally and so there's actual like esports physical therapists that i've talked to i'm like how do you like smash brothers melee in particular is awful on your hands terrible on your hands um and in Tetris, Tetris, uh, I'm talking like classic Tetris on the NES. Um, there's a new, uh, uh, there's a new method called hyper tapping when it's actually adopted by all the new generation of players and uh, like like 16 year old kids, and they're all having hand issues at 16 years old because of the way they're they're doing this Tetris technique. That's a little bit outside of the fighting game <laughs> realm, but basically yeah yeah, injuries and whatnot like carpal tunnel and uh nerve pain and all that stuff really does factor into um like fighting game uh, like playing and taking breaks and sitting with appropriate posture and all that stuff yeah um it's it's, yeah it's hyper tapping the one where you vibrate your fingers on the back you roll your fingers on the back of the controller yes uh yeah okay because i don't remember where i saw a video maybe or, I have a son and he doesn't sleep. So I was really late at night on YouTube, like two, two in the morning. And I was watching a video about that. And I was like, that's so interesting. You just roll your, because you tap faster by like bumping the back of the controller into your finger. Yeah. As opposed to, yeah, that's interesting. I didn't know. That makes uh, sense. The, the latest technique that I've seen is like they flip the controller over. So that way oh. the left and right on the pad is making contact with your knee. And then you use your left and right fingers to press on the back of the controller and that'll help it that like you can use the gravity oh. of the controller to depress the buttons faster dang okay yeah dude that's intense. <laughs> i saw that i was like what? this yeah. is blowing my mind that's yeah, that's dude. tetris though uh, <laughs> i don't have like <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah there's there's some idiosyncrasies with fighting game sticks too like um i actually don't even play on a on a fight stick i play on a thing called a hitbox where you take your arcade stick oh. and then you swap it out with four directional buttons instead so it's kind of like oh, a, wow. a wasd setup Oh, I see. well, that'd be so weird. Okay, is that pretty common, or just like you're a hipster? Um, it it's becoming <laughs> more common. Um, I see. Yeah, before like fighting games were so uh, influenced by arcade culture because that's where Street Fighter Two came up, that's where Mortal Kombat came up and stuff. Um, mm-hmm. that you you didn't actually want to learn how to play on another control, kind of controller because then you wouldn't be able to play at arcade tournaments. 
because you're playing on a cabinet, right? Right. Um, but nowadays, no one runs tournaments on arcade cabinets anymore. No one arcades aren't really that that common anymore. Uh, they're making a resurgence with arcades and whatnot, but like uh, because of that, everybody can play on anything they want. Uh, I saw mm-hmm. someone try to play on a Guitar Hero controller. That doesn't work, but it, it's, <laughs> it's novel. <laughs> Yeah, interesting. Ooh, I have a question about that then. So, like, arcades are kind of going away, right? And kind of mm-hmm. making a comeback, but not really, right? Um, like, how has that affected like the whole scene, right? Because like now with COVID, there's the online potential, yeah. right? Like, how does that all work together now? Um, so the pandemic definitely impacted the FGC. Um, online fighting games. I mentioned that you know you're playing at milliseconds of timing. Um, so th- things like your your computer monitor, like if there's any display latency or input lag on the console or anything like that, uh, we had an instance where the um, the heat, like we had a PlayStation, like a PlayStation will overheat more often and it'll actually cause it to drop frames and then that Im- impacts timing as well. So if you take that and like those kinds of volatile situations and then you put that online as well where you have packet loss and you know high pings or like you know some some relay server that i was talking to hiccuped somewhere and so now i have my latency spiked so therefore i dropped frames um your net code on your fighting game is really important um and so up until i want to say 2014 or so um there wasn't really a gold standard for net code um, and so fighting games were virtually impossible to play online. So what ends up happening then is you have, if, if you can't play the game, if you want to play the game competitively, but you can't play it online, then the only thing you can do is go to your locals. And, mm. and by impossible, I mean like they have online modes, but they just, they feel like crap. There's delay on your inputs. There's rollback that's unnecessary. There's, um, you know, it just feels sluggish. There's stuttering and freezing and whatnot. Um, so when, when COVID rolled around, like, you know, our scene thrives on in-person contact and, you know, major events and where everybody's in a room together. And so COVID forced all of us to play online and basically settle for um, uh, a lesser experience. Um, so what that's forced the FGC to do and what that's, that's forced game developers to do is actually uh, do, do better at coding netcode. Um, and, uh, doing a bunch of different rollback techniques to to minimize input lag and um then build tournament circuits based on that because now we're talking like hundreds of thousands of dollars on the line and for some of these online tournaments um and just the online scene kind of skyrocketed because of the pandemic because that was our only way to keep playing fighting games that makes sense yeah i remember i was talking to you about that earlier where that one guy was basically shitting on Capcom and saying he was going to yeah. go play Guilty Gear, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. So he was shitting on Capcom because the netcode sucks in Street Fighter V. Um, it, it, it's get, it stutters a lot, and that affects your, competi- your, your, your ability to compete. Um, so that, that guy in particular, you're talking about Punk, he's, he's, uh, he's mm-hmm. very young. Uh, he's <laughs> also very... Uh, he's one of the best like in, in or he's if not the best player in street fighter five so he gets kind of uh an ego i suppose or he's got this he's got this <laughs> the standing to say stuff like that um yeah. but it's kind of funny yeah just, just to give people a background on it so basically he wins the capcom like the street fighter five tournament right at that point and then they're interviewing him and the official Capcom channel, and he just basically starts shitting on Capcom and oh Street Fighter God. and how, yep. how the netcode sucks. <laughs> that was some tact, man. <laughs> <laughs> Kids these days, man. He's actually yeah. been banned from a from a tournament before, or put in loser oh. put in loser's bracket because of uh, saying things like that, <laughs> and actually put, putting that on his opponents, being like, "Hey, you have shitty internet. It's your fault. I lost." And it's unsportsmanlike. Oh my God! I guess. No, no, we're on to talking to people. Uh, do you recommend any streamers or YouTubers that any, people could like? I guess follow. There's always like a following around like famous people in this area. Yeah, yeah. So um, it it kind of depends on your degree of uh, like how how deep you want to get into fighting games, right? So if you're just like a casual fan and you want to like, you know, like you really like the lore, or the art, or you want if you want to like be entertained more so and be a spectator, like Maximilian is a really good uh, YouTuber slash Twitch player. 
Um, he doesn't him. really go super deep into fighting games, but sorry, say that one more time. I watch him. He's cool. I like watching yeah. him. <laughs> yeah, he's cool. Um, I've, I, I, there are a couple times where like before he got really big, like he got really big with Marvel versus Capcom three, and like I remember just like hanging out with him a lot, or, or like and and seeing him a lot at Evo, and uh, he's a uh, pretty, he's a really very real person, uh, like down to earth and doesn't have a huge ego or anything. I think that's what makes him so successful with a casual audience. Um, if you want to get into like competitive scene, if you're a beginner level player, I'd recommend uh, James Chen. Um, he's mm-hmm. a commentator, but he's really good at breaking it down in, in the layman's terms. Um, and then like the high quality, if the deeper you get, but even, even then the, the other YouTubers that I'm going to mention are also just really good in general. Uh, Say Jam who is another commentator, he talks, he breaks down fighting game theory a lot. And then Core A Gaming, uh, which is a YouTuber from Korea. So it's C-O-R dash, C-O-R-E dash A, like Core dash okay. A, okay, core. but also Korea, uh, Korea Gaming. <laughs> um, and uh, he makes like really just good, good tutorials on like, this is why movement is important in fighting games, or this is why button mashing doesn't work. And it's just really high quality, informative. <laughs> I still try. <laughs> so, nice. That's good. The good good resources. I'll probably post them on the links links on the Wait, uh, wait, wait. Notes. I have one more. I have one oh, more. I have so, one so. more. I know this one channel called Spiral Series. Yeah, you can do that too. <laughs> Link in do the comments too. below. Yeah, he's pretty cool. <laughs> awesome. So it, I guess the final question, which is not really like a it's kind of like a wild card. Did you grow up playing games and kind of watch what is this kind of like your childhood game? If you did. Yeah. Not, I um, doesn't have to be a fighting game. It could be anything. Yeah. Uh, my, my dad bought me an NES when I was really young. I mainly, I just think he bought it for himself so he could play on it. Um, <laughs> and a lot of different NES games that I think of when I think of early childhood, but super Mario brothers three is probably the one that like, I think of the most. Um, and then like the first game I, that I ever beat uh, cause I couldn't beat Mario three. I couldn't beat a lot of NES games cause they were hard. Uh, but Kirby's dreamland was the first game that I beat. And, mm. uh, I remember reading that like that was by design. They made it easy on purpose for young players to be able to beat their first video game. Oh, I see. Yeah. Dude. Games back in the day, they were not easy. Yeah. Like, you <laughs> couldn't beat them. Like yeah, if you were five, I don't know how old you were when you were playing games, but I was five when I first started playing games mm. and I just was stuck. I was playing Sonic the Hedgehog too. I was stuck in there forever. You're just playing it again. If you all your lives run out, to tough shit, go back to the beginning, start yeah. again. <laughs> yeah, a lot of that's actually cool. rooted in arcade culture too, because you'd have a game that was ported over <laughs> from the arcades, and so it's hard on purpose that way. When the more you die, the more quarters you get, you know? Right. Yeah. Or you know, sadistic like the Lion King. <laughs> Dude, that game, man. I had that game too. My parents thought it would be cute. That game is a nightmare. For a child, <laughs> it's like it's, it's so hard. I remember uh, watching a speedrunner recently beat it, and I'm just like, "Why? Don't do this to me!" The uh, giraffe part is where I got stuck. Mm-hmm. They just don't go. It doesn't make sense. As a kid, it didn't make sense. The pattern didn't click. Oh man, you, well, that's awesome. Even that's now, awesome. watching speedrunner, it doesn't make sense. So I don't know what you're <laughs> Yeah. Mm. Oh man. Ooh, I have a question. Something that's always been on my mind about fighting games. Yeah. Have you heard of Salty Vet? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that was um, one of the FGC folks <laughs> set it up. Uh, How is like what is that game called? Mugen or something like that, right? Yeah, Mugen. Um, Mugen. Yeah. Like, what is the thoughts on that? Because I've always seen like the Salty Vet channel, and they're just playing fighting games, and I was just like, that's neat. Like, how yeah. do people take that? Um. Uh, we all took it for like we were super excited when we saw Salty Vet come out because it was just fun to just the uh, have drinks with friends and then say who's gonna win. Um, mm-hmm. That's actually like blown up in recent times where there's a show that Sajam puts on called Will It Kill, and what he does is he puts he brings up fighting game clips and it, he just he pauses them like right when a combo happens and he says, "Is this combo gonna kill?" And you just have uh-huh. to guess and see are, are they dead or not. And it's just always these hype moments. Yeah. Salty bet? So yeah. yeah. So this? just to give you some background, so yeah. uh Mijin is like a game engine, right? That they just uh-huh. 
ported a bunch of different fighting games characters and non-fighting game characters. And then Salty Bet was this Twitch channel that basically just had like they were I'm assuming they were AI controlled, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. And then they're just fighting and it's just match after matchup after matchup of just these two AIs going at it. It's really mm-hmm. cool. So the cool thing about it is, so Mugen is like an open, uh, I don't know if I would call it open source, but it's a game that's easily moddable, and so you can actually add any kind of characters in. And it, the fighting game engine itself is completely busted. Like, it's not a good game, <laughs> but it's, like, you could you could actually import other, engi- other like, uh, game mechanics, like parries and, you know, like, super meters and whatnot. And so what ends up happening is everybody creates these custom characters, they rip them from other fighting games, and you just get this mad crossover. So, like, you know, a, a, a meme for Salty Bet was like, okay, I'm going to, if I'm going to bet, I'm always going to bet on Dragon Ball characters because they always win. Or like, unless you see Omega Tom Hanks, and Omega Tom Hanks is always going to win this match. <laughs> you know, it's like, they're, they're like uh, Peter Griffin versus Homer Simpson, or, you know, like Mortal Kombat, uh, a Mortal Kombat ninja versus a maid. <laughs> like, it's just, just random, <laughs> random stuff. They're awesome. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. I, I didn't know about this. That's funny. Oh man. I guess like the last thing I had, I posted that link uh, to uh what's it called? Donkey's video on oh, yeah. how to get to the top top rank. <laughs> I I'm sure you guys have seen it. If yeah. not, it's super cheese. I don't know. Like so I I can s- reminds me of like the Mortal Kombat like sweeping kick, right? So the, the video is just this guy, Donkey, going climbing the ranks going with this cheese move uh, on guilty gear and i guess you just want to take get your take on that like is yeah, that sure. a thing people do and is that a viable strategy does it, i mean he seems to have climbed the ranks just fine yeah so the way um so he plays a character called may uh, and uh-huh. what you do is um she's got a move where she uh rides a dolphin and uh, she's got two different kinds of dolphins she rides she rides a dolphin that's fast and a dolphin that's slow and um, the dolphin that is slow can be interrupted or you can, but if they block it, then you can actually loop it and do it again. So it creates this cheese situation that you mentioned where you're, you're basically just looping that dolphin over and over and over again. And it's, it's she's, she's yelling Mr. Dolphin the whole time. It's, it's pretty <laughs> annoying. Um, and if you don't know how to beat it, it's got a hard counter, but if you don't know how to beat it, you're going to lose to it. Um, and so, uh, yeah, in this video, he's basically climbing up using that same strategy over and over again. Um, and it's that's both really that, like that's a guilty gear thing where guilty mm-hmm. gear you basically are trying to execute your win condition at all times. So some characters are really good at far range pokes. May's really good at putting a big hitbox on the screen and uh, in, in the form of a <laughs> dolphin and or an anchor and just trying to smother smother their opponent until they die. Um, and so. Donkey's video was clipped to show every time he used that string, but he didn't necessarily necessarily use that to win the entire thing. Um, I see. Now, every now and then, you're going to run into an opponent that doesn't know what to do in that scenario, and if you know, it's like Sun Tzu Art of War stuff, where if it doesn't, if it keep, if it works once, you just keep hammering on that and expend the least <laughs> amount of energy thinking about what your other options are because there's, this option is going to keep working. Why bother trying anything else? Um, and then, yeah, he climbed up to Celestial Rank, where Guilty Gear's got a tower that you climb, basically, and it goes from 1 through 10, and then at 10, you get to get, go to Celestial, uh, which is the top the top floor. Um, but in the competitive community, that's actually where all the scrubs live. <laughs> oh. uh, including okay, so myself. I guess I didn't climb that high. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, it's just, it's it's like, the, the, the tower is really good for if you're new to fighting games, and you just want to be, like, really close to those people at your level. But there's a point where... Like nowadays, it's if you know how to play fighting games, you're on floor nine and ten. And if you if you are good at fighting games, then you're in celestial. Uh, which I think that Donkey is good at fighting games, or he knows how to play them at least. Um, and if you don't know how to play, you're like you know floors one through eight. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean he does like add, I mean his videos are satire, right? He makes fun oh, yeah. of stuff and he knows how to play games. But I just thought it's funny because it's always like that one person doing those cheese moves and and it's super frustrating. Yeah. And, I, and it's just like, ah, oh, can you please play the game properly or something? But I, I just, I laugh the whole time because it, it's funny. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine. <laughs> in, old, in older games, like uh, in arcades, right, you'd actually have like house rules where you're not allowed to throw anybody because if you throw, that's cheap. 
you know? And then <laughs> I, I had a, I had a, a friend, uh, he's, he's significantly older than I am. Um, and I say that cause I'm going to tell him, I'm going to sh- show him this podcast. <laughs> he's way <laughs> older than I am. Uh, okay. he had a knife pulled on him at desert sky. <laughs> oh, dang. And because he threw, he threw too much or he was winning too much or something like that. So like <sighs> there are these like, people just got it in their minds that blocking was cheap or like no blocking allowed only honor system where you gotta, you gotta like strike each other, you know, and that it, nothing is like, if it's in the game then it should be, it's fair game. Like it's fair to, to use. No, there's nothing that's inherently right. unfair, I guess. But I guess you couldn't patch games back in the day. Right. So I guess if that's the only thing, I, I don't know. I, I, I go both ways. Cause I, I remember, playing with my brothers as kids and we had rules too and we would get into like actual fights because we were like mm-hmm. you can't do that anymore or whatever it's just it was just yeah it, it, if we had knives they would be out all right <laughs> <laughs> so i understand Frust- the frustration oh that's fun i believe it i have one all final right. question if yeah go ahead, man. all right what is your opinion on the 1994 Street Fighter movie. I was going to ask that too. <laughs> uh, is that one the animated one or the Jean-Claude Van Damme one? Jean-Claude Van Damme. Uh, I have not. I've seen bits and pieces of it. Um, oh, I, you're breaking my heart. Yeah, I hear it's a cult <laughs> classic. It's got, a, it's got a dream cast and that's cool. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, you know, I've heard, I've heard it's, it's way better than the, than the, the um animated tv show uh but the and then the animated movie is probably the best of the three disagree but that's okay. <laughs> it's not a good movie man you know it's not a good movie yeah. <laughs> bro it had such many so many good one-liners though like you sit there you're just entertained the entire time and it's like it was mortal a good Kombat, movie. right so yeah i'm gonna get in my oh, boat i'm gonna go over and kick bison's <laughs> ass into the future or something i forget what he says <laughs> Yeah. For, for me it's only know. it was only tuesday <laughs> yeah that's such a good line the delivery yeah bison is the best we'll have to watch that and review it on the podcast and yeah. john you're welcome to join us if yeah you, that'd be cool uh, since it's like down your alley but yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay all right guys well i don't want to take this super long but that was pretty informative pretty awesome thank you for taking the time john to talk to us about this scene it's, i learned a ton yeah anytime uh it's awesome. Well, anyway, with that, we're out. Peace. See ya. Later. Cheers. Thank you for listening. If you like this podcast, please give us a star, heart, or leave us a review. You can follow us on Twitch, Twitter, or YouTube at Popstomp Podcast. That's P U B S T O M P O D Cast. For more episodes, go to anchor.fm slash Pubstomp. Music provided by 99 Lives. Credits are in the episode description.